All right, we're here with James Diogenio. He's the author of The JFK Assassination, The Evidence Today, and he's the editor and publisher of KennedysandKing.com. Today we're going to talk about his review of Tom Hanks's 1968. Jim wrote a review on KennedysandKing.com, which you can find there, uh, and uh, Jim tagged it as a thoroughly mediocre rendering of a tumultuous year, mediocre in every way, including aesthetically. So Jim is going to talk about that today. Thanks for joining us, Jim. Okay, thank you, David. Nice to be with you again. Um, the complete title is 1968, the year that changed history. And I agree with the subtitle because 1968 was probably the most tumultuous year in American history since the end of World War II. Uh, it was a, just an amazing series of events that one after another, most of them unexpected. Okay, there was surprise after surprise after surprise after surprise, going all the way from the Tet Offensive to Nixon being elected, which I don't think very many people would have foreseen at the beginning of that year. All right, now I'd like to say that Tom Hanks and Gary Goetzman made a documentary that was up to the subject, but in my opinion, it's not even close. All right, it's, it's a typical one of their, uh, they do several of these historical profiles, like the 60s, the 70s, the, et cetera, all right? And they all come out being more or less the same. They look the same, they, they, the content is similar in that they use these mainstream sources, all right? Uh, there's no real invention to any of the stylistic things. It's All it is is archival footage plus talking heads, all right? There's no real original use of photography, of music, you know? And because they use all of these mainstream media sources, there's nothing really interesting uh, as to the content of them either. All right. Now, by the way, now, l let me add something here. Uh, in this interview, I'm going to go beyond what's in my article. All right. In the last, say, 10 to 15 years, when I talk about aesthetically, um, no aesthetic achievement in this film, the documentary form has had some new stylistic devices added to it, most notably by Adam Curtis, the British filmmaker, who his film on Al-Qaeda, The Power of Nightmares, I think that's online. Anybody who hasn't seen that film should see it now, because not only did... Adam Curtis find commentators who were willing, you know, he was willing to listen to these people who were off the beaten path and therefore had new and original insights to this phenomenon of Islamic fundamentalism and how it began. But stylistically, that film is so many rocket miles above anything that Hanks has done. You know, that it's it, watching it is like night and day with this. Mm. I mean, just watching it, not listening to it, but the way Adam Curtis used uh, the documentary medium, you know, was really new and different. And and I think that means something. Another film that did this is the film The Kid Stays in the Picture. OK, about Robert Evans. Right. If you if you take a look at that film. All right. Those people did, you know, some really interesting things. All right. With the actual documentary form. All right. And if you take a look at the DVD. Um, and the DVD, they actually talk about some of the things that they did that was that was different and original. That film had two directors, Nanette Bernstein and Brett Morgan, 
And Brett Morgan is the guy who on the DVD, uh, the narr narrative track, he talks about why he did certain things, you know, and that break away out of this constant back and forth between archival footage and talking heads. See, and, and, and this is what I'm talking about. You know, now I'm not saying that every documentary, you know, has to be that inventive, okay, or has to take risks like that. But what I'm saying is if you choose a bunch of MSM, you know, blithering idiots as your commentators who offer absolutely no new insight, you know, into the subject, then maybe you should do a little thing different in the way you present it to maintain an interest. Right. Okay. But, but, you know, you know, this might be as far as Hanks and Gary Goldsman goes, this is the dark side of the moon to them. All right. Now, I also want to explain in my essay, I want to explain why I believe Playtone, which is their film company, churns out these thoroughly mediocre products. All right. And that I think owes to the friendship of Hanks and Spielberg, his buddy Steven Spielberg, with the late historian Stephen Ambrose. All right. Ambrose made his mark on the American scene with his books about Dwight Eisenhower. All right. Especially his two volume formal biography published in 1983 and 1984. All of his books about Eisenhower, and I think there were about five of them, except the first one, were published after Eisenhower died in 1969. Later on, it was proven, and I mean really proven, by both an Eisenhower archivist and his appointment secretary that Ambrose made up numerous interviews that he supposedly did with Eisenhower. And these guys proved that he could not have been with Eisenhower at those times. And in my book, the JFK assassination, the evidence today, I go ahead and quote that information. All right. Now, later on, I think it was after he passed away, Ambrose, Ambrose, no, no, actually, I think it was when he was alive. Ambrose was also proven to be a serial plagiarist. Mm -hmm. And in the article here, I quote two sources for that. All right. All right. But in my opinion, that's not the worst. The worst is that what Ambrose did with his friend James Bakke and his interesting, very interesting and milestone book, Other Losses. James Bakke had done some real digging into the military archives of World War II. And by the way, this is exactly the kind of thing that Ambrose didn't do. All right? And he later admitted it that he was more interested in the storytelling aspect of history than in the scholarly digging aspect of history. All right. Bakhu had made some very, very interesting discoveries about the Allies' treatment of the German prisoners of war, okay, and the cover-up that was entailed after it. He sent his manuscript to Ambrose in advance of publication, and Ambrose had nothing but praise for it. In 1989, before the book was to be published abroad, Bakhtu then visited Ambrose at his home, and the two went over the book in detail. When other losses were published in the United States, Ambrose at first stood by the book, but the book was generating controversy, of course, because it accused the allies, including Eisenhower, of deliberately starving literally tens of thousands of German prisoners of war. After he did a teaching engagement at the U.S. Army War College, Ambrose began to reverse field. First, he organized a seminar attacking the book. Then, as he would do with Oliver Stone's film JFK, he wrote a negative article for the New York Times. 
Now, as James Bach, you noted, the book that was published is the same book that Ambrose looked at twice before publication, all right, which he had so much effusive praise for. The difference was, of course, that now that information was public and it was creating a rather sensational reaction, all right? And so the establishment now was calling upon Mr. Ambrose, who was supposed to be the expert on Eisenhower, okay, to go ahead and answer these charges. And to put it very simply, Ambrose did their bidding, all right, under pressure from the New York Times and the military. Not only did he attack the book in the New York Times, not only did he engage a panel down in New Orleans to attack the book in public, but he then published a book based upon the panel to counter Bakke's book. And in my article, I have Bakke's reply there, okay, to that, uh, that book panel. Bakke later wrote that he couldn't really blame Ambrose for all this because the American establishment does not really value accuracy in the historical record. What it wants is, quote, a pleasing chronicle which justifies and supports the society. He then added that in light of that fact, quote, we should not wonder when a very popular writer like Ambrose is revealed to be both a liar and a plagiar plagiarizer because he has in fact given us what we demand from him above all. That is a pleasing myth. And this is why I believe that Hanks and Spielberg were attracted to this guy because that's essentially what they're about. OK, you know, Hanks and Spielberg are not real diggers into history. OK, I mean, Spielberg optioned a book on Charles Lindbergh without knowing, number one, that he was a Nazi sympathizer and number two, that he was a bigamist, mm -hmm. that he had a he had a secret family in Europe at the time he was married. OK, he didn't even know that before he optioned a book. OK, and, and uh, the other indication of how bad these guys are were in the, the movie The Post, trying to make heroes and heroines out of Kay Graham and Ben Bradley on the Vietnam War, which is utterly ridiculous. Right. All right. And which which I reviewed in, in my book, The JFK Assassination, the Evidence Today, I, I, I doubled the length on that review because I had to see the movie twice. To really understand how bad it really was. But see, this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of history that interests these two guys. That interests, see, unlike Oliver Stone, who was attracted to people who push the envelope, who go beyond the parameters of historical scholarship, like for example, John Newman, you know, in the movie JFK. John Newman's pioneering work on Kennedy's intent to withdraw from Vietnam. See, that wouldn't be attractive to these guys, you know. Right. All right. So anyway, all of that, I believe, is important to understanding this latest documentary, 1968, the year that changed America. All right. Now, Hanks, let's just talk very briefly about some of the feature films he's produced. Charlie Wilson's War, Parkland, and The Post. These tried to make heroes and heroines out of people who were not. For example, the late Representative Charlie Wilson right. and the war in Afghanistan. The Dallas Police in his film Parkland about the Kennedy assassination. And as I've mentioned, Ben Bradley and Kay Graham on the war in Vietnam and the Pentagon Papers. In my opinion, those films I, – I really don't think there's any two ways about it. Those films ended up being misleading about all those subjects, about the origins and results of the war in Afghanistan, about the assassination of President Kennedy, and about the position of the Washington Post on the Vietnam War. All right. Now, since he wrote about Eisenhower – one of Ambrose's preoccupations was World War II. He wrote at least a dozen books on World War II. Hanks and Spielberg took a vignette 
out of his book Band of Brothers and greatly expanded and heavily revised it into the movie Saving Private Ryan, which I also discuss in my book, The JFK Assassination, The Evidence Today. From there, Hanks and Spielberg produced the very expensive miniseries Band of Brothers on HBO. All right. That was a chronicle of a company of American soldiers fighting in the European theater until the surrender of Japan. In addition to those two, Hanks has produced three documentaries on the subject of American soldiers fighting in Europe. And as anybody who's seen Saving Private Ryan knows, that film is largely based on the Allied landing at Normandy in 1944. And Ambrose wrote a lot on that particular event. In fact, one of his books was titled D-Day, June 6, 1944, The Climactic Battle of World War II. And in the films by Hanks and Spielberg and the documentaries they produced, that's the effect that they want to convey, that America defeated the Third Reich. Right. Well, well but see, the, the thing is, the problem, we get back to this original problem I noted with Hanks in his films Parkland, Charlie Wilson's War, and The Post. It's, it's not true to say that. Any, any authority who has studied World War II will tell you that to say America defeated Hitler is a mythology out of a high school textbook. All right, It's simply not accurate. And in fact, you, the thing is, you don't get into this, since I was a history major, you don't get into this until you get into about a 300-level class as an undergraduate. Because even in, even in something like Western Civ, Civ or U.S. history on a 100 and 200 level, you're not, probably not going to get to Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa was Hitler's massive invasion of Russia, okay, in 1941. It was a defeat of Barbarossa by the Russians that was the climactic battle of World War II. I don't think any historian would argue with that. All right. All right. This took, and that climactic battle took place in 1942 at Stalingrad. All right. And, and to a lesser extent, in 1943 with the tank battle at Kursk. You know, both of those gigantic battles took place prior to Normandy, and Hitler gambled everything on them. And I'm, I literally mean that. He gambled everything on those two battles. His invasion of Russia in 1941 consumed 80% of the Wehrmacht, 80% of the German army, over 3 million men. To this day, it's the largest land invasion in history. All right? Now, again, I'm going to go a little bit further than I did in this essay. Hitler probably would have won Operation Barbarossa, except he made three mistakes. In all three of these mistakes, he overruled his general staff. Okay? First... That invasion was supposed to take place in April of 1941 because the German generals wanted, as long as they could, a long time interval to make sure they got into Moscow before the winter started falling. Well, Hitler delayed it because he needed – he always had a soft spot for Mussolini. Mussolini begged him for some help in Greece and the Balkans, and so – Hitler took 200,000 men off the Russian front and sent them into Greece to help uh, Mussolini. And they didn't get back for like six or seven weeks. All right. So the invasion was delayed and it went in June instead of April. The second big mistake was that the German generals had so much success moving this giant German army so fast through Russia that they actually were, were exceeding their schedule. for they, they were covering 70 miles a day, mm -hmm. which is amazing with this giant army. So they decided 
to bypass the city of Kiev in the Ukraine. Well, when Hitler heard that, he overruled the generals and told them to go back and take the city. All right. So laying siege to the city and then having the city fall took another six weeks. So that that's 13 weeks that he lost there. All right. So when he when the German army does get to the outskirts of Moscow and they're about to descend into the city, the snow starts falling. And it's the worst Russian winter in 100 years. All right. And so what happens, of course, in a, a military sense, what this did. See, it's not really true to say that the Russians stopped the Blitzkrieg. It was really the Russian winner that stopped the Blitzkrieg. Because between the combination of freezing temperatures and foot upon foot of snow, the Panzer tanks couldn't move anymore. They were literally stuck there. All right. All right. And so these these what happened was it got so cold that the gasoline froze in the gas tanks. Mm. Right. And then the temperature dropped so much and Hitler was so certain that his army would be in Moscow by the time the snow started flying that he didn't give them any any winter clothing. OK. And these guys started to get frostbite. So once the Russian general Zhukov saw that the Blitzkrieg was stopped, he arranged a furious counterattack. OK. And so for the first time, the German army now began to fall back. All right. And so at this point, and this was the third mistake. The German generals recommended that they go back behind the Volga River, wait for the spring, and launch another counteroffensive. And so Hitler disagreed, and he said, we're going to battle it out at Stalingrad. All right. And so he moved most of the German army from Moscow and said that it was a, it was a three-headed attack. One army was, was at Leningrad. One was aimed at Moscow, one at Stalingrad. He moved a large amount of the Moscow army down to Stalingrad, all right, because he thought since the Ukraine was so rich in things like you know uh, petroleum, etc., that that would be the most enticing target. And this ended up being the, the fatal mistake. This is what eventually – undermined Barbarossa because what he was doing now see the whole greatness of the German army the whole originality of the concept was that the Blitzkrieg could move tremendous amounts of armor artillery and infantry mechanized infantry all right vast amounts of distances stop and have tremendous firepower, knock out the enemy and move to the next target. But now what Hitler is asking these guys to do is to essentially fight it out in a giant gang war in Stalingrad because for the simple reason, Stalingrad was a city of about 275,000 people. When both the German army moved in and the Russian army moved in. You now had about two million guys there. All right. And so it, that's what it ended up being. It ended up being a street war. In other words, it was fought by block to block, building to building, sometimes window by window when you would get a, a really good sniper in there. You know, it would take like seven hours to get him out of a building. And so the problem was that, A, the Russians had more men there, and B, they knew the city better. Okay? All right? And so when it was all over, the German army was defeated, and there's varying estimates of this. 
I'm going to go with the, the one that I've seen that makes the most sense to me was when, when Stalingrad was over. Hitler lost through either dead, captured, or wounded. 750,000 men hmm. at the siege of Stalingrad. All right? It, it's, it was really one of the most terrible defeats in military history. All right? And so that was essentially the end of Barbarossa. All right? Okay? Now, the other thing is Hitler tried to counter that defeat with a tank battle at Kursk in 1943. And that particular battle, the estimates are that it was over 6,000 tanks involved in that battle. There, I think there were 3,300 Russian tanks and something like 2,700 German tanks involved in that battle. And people who have analyzed it say it was really kind of a tie. But since Hitler had to win... It was really a defeat. So now you had the German infantry was now neutralized. And at Kursk, you had the great the, – the, the great German invention of World War II. And the reason that made the Blitzkrieg so unstoppable was the Panzer tank. But Hitler lost so many of those tanks between the Russian invasion – and Kursk, that the whole greatness, the originality, the striking power of the German army was now pretty much wrecked on the steps of Russia. So that is really how the Third Reich was defeated. It wasn't this D-Day thing. You know, it wasn't, you know, Churchill and Alamein, et cetera. I mean, Rommel basically got scraps left over from Operation Barbarossa to fight Montgomery in North Africa. I mean, it's amazing what Rommel did there, considering he was taking on the whole British Eighth Army with a bunch of second string, you know, infantry guys and third string tanks. All right. All right, and so that's – see, this is why – and this is something I, I really – I really take people like Ambrose a task for. This is why the Allied invasion of France was successful because the great part of the German army you know, had been essentially neutralized on the Russian front. If that wouldn't have happened, I don't believe that D-Day would have been successful. All right. All right. So so anyway, anyway, this is a problem that I've had with Ambrose, Ambrose Spielberg and Hanks. All right. Now, picking up on that. The because of the Cold War, because of the idea that we weren't going to give the Russians any credit because they were now our enemies. The historical establishment ignored Operation Barbarossa. Like Ambrose, they chose to glorify what people like Eisenhower had done in Europe and to a lecture extent MacArthur in the Pacific. In Hollywood and television, in the film industry, all right, they followed that model. Movies like The Longest Day, Anzio, Battle of the Bulge, were echoed by small screen productions like the TV series Combat, The Gallant Men, and 12 O'Clock High. You know, and so parents bought their kids, you know, toy weapons, you know, and they played games modeled on this whole thing of America crushing the Nazis. All right. The, the social and historical problem with that in books, films, and network television was simple. This contributed – See, this illusion that the United States had defeated the Germans, that illusion contributed a cultural mythology of American omnipotence, both in its military might and its moral cause. And that pretense 
of both might and right was slowly and excruciatingly ground to pieces in the jungles of Indochina. You know, this is a very important cultural issue that I never have seen Ambrose before he passed away, Hanks or Spielberg, ever deal with that issue in any real sense. You know, and I really don't think any of them have ever confronted it. You know, if you can make a film so weirdly lopsided as The Post, then I think you can say for whatever reason it's just not in them. You know, Hanks, after all, is 61. Spielberg is 71. If after a combined 132 years on this planet, they still don't comprehend this, then it's probably too late. You know, and I tried to understand this a little bit in my book, The JFK Assassination, The Evidence Today. And I spend some pages going into their backgrounds to try and comprehend it. Right. All right. So with all that as a backdrop. Well, before we go on, let me just ask you, um, you know, we have like uh, this whole Russia Gate thing going on now. And kind of before it, you had Hillary Clinton calling Putin you know, Hitler and basically people ignoring uh, the facts of what happened in World War II. What do you think that's doing now with the whole conversation about Trump and Putin and uh, Russiagate and all this stuff? you think this, this blind spot about World War II is having any effect on that conversation? Well, look, there's a great part of the historical establishment in this country all right, that has something invested in reigniting the Cold War, all right? And a great part of it never really wanted to see the Cold War actually end, you know? And so I believe that for whatever reason, you know, I think a lot of it is commercialized. I think that people at CNN, especially, you know, you know, they have something invested in seeing this whole Russian boogeyman, you know, resurrected. All right. You know, and because they think it draws in viewers. I think the Democratic Party is invested in it. Because they see it as a way of wounding Trump, all right, and bringing down the Republicans. All right. You know, I, I'm kind of doubtful that there's anything really there. Okay, you know, I'm not saying it isn't. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that, you know, when Mueller has to indict a troll farm, you know, which specializes in clickbait, all right. you know, okay, like he did. And now, yesterday, he returned this indictment of, I think, 12 people in the GRU, when in fact, you know, what intelligence does the United States have in, in Russia right now that you can base evidence on this? You know? Right. Uh, you know, so, you know, I'm not saying there's nothing there, but I'm, I'm saying that I really think that there is a kind of conscious push, you know, to try and make a lot out of relatively little, you know. And then the other issue I have with this, you know, why is it OK for the United States to intervene in Russian elections and Ukraine elections? You know, but somehow it's a dastardly deed, you know, when they do things like this. At the very worst, hacking the DNC website. Right. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, I just don't see the comparison. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're aware it was it was Bill Clinton who saved Boris Yeltsin. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was going to lose the election. All right. Bill Clinton sent money, his advisors over, you know, and Yeltsin did some very, very shady things. Mm -hmm. OK. In order to maintain power. And then in the Ukraine, I mean, my God, that film Ukraine on Fire, which I reviewed for Bob Perry at Consortium News, I mean, that's a very good expose of what the United States did there. So, you know, I have a real problem with this kind of hypocrisy.
you know? Yeah, oh, I agree. All right, now, coming to the actual film itself, 1968, the year they changed America, this was broadcast by CNN, all right? And CNN has been a prime outlet for Hanks' documentaries, all right? And I have a problem with a show that has his main talking heads – uh, people like Pat Buchanan, Tim Naftali, and Evan Thomas. And then we get Dan Rather. We get the Washington Post, Thomas Ricks, Nixon employee Dwight Chapin, and Tom Hanks himself. All right. I don't think that's a very um, distinguished panel. All right. It's certainly nothing more than mainstream bloviating if you if you ask me it begins with dan rather discussing the fading presidency of lbj and so we get the usual standby cliche that lbj passed some good domestic legislation like medicare but how this was outweighed by this war in vietnam all right right here i i thought the, i thought that they missed a very good opportunity to make a parallel with today you know, that is, Vietnam was called the living room war because for the first time you had journalists like Morley Safer, and I clicked to an, uh, a video of him during Vietnam, being right there in the middle of military operations. And this brought the brutality right in to your dining room. So like as you were eating dinner, you were watching things like the Tet Offensive, okay? Later on, the Pentagon realized that that was a mistake. So in later wars, that was very much cut back. What took its place was something called the junket or press pool or sometimes called the embedded reporter. Mm -hmm. You know, certain journalists who they trusted – were given very restricted access, accompanied by escorts, and they reported back to their colleagues. And then that's how a very censored vision of the news operated in things like Operation Desert Storm and the invasion of Iraq, especially the siege of Fallujah. I mean, that was the only way you could see what the United States was doing at Fallujah is that somebody posted – some film that an Italian TV station, you know, had taken of what was going on at Fallujah. That's the only way that you could see that the United States was using phosphorus, you know, at, at the city of Fallujah. All right. Now, the second lost opportunity was, I believe, explaining precisely why Johnson had become so unpopular by 1968. And the main reason for that is because in 1964, he had run on a peace platform, and he tried to portray Barry Goldwater as being the hawk on Vietnam. Well, once he was elected, he completely went back on that promise, all right? And he began to break with Kennedy's policy of having no combat troops in Vietnam. So by the end of 1965, America had 175,000 combat troops in Vietnam. By the 1968, there were about a half a million there. And if that wasn't enough, you also had Rolling Thunder, the largest aerial bombardment campaign in military history. And because he escalated the war so much… There had to be a draft, and there began to be, for very good reasons, resistance to that draft. This, and that's why Johnson became so unpopular. And I believe this film discounts all of those points. All right, but you can't do that. All right, and understand just how bad it got for Johnson. 
All right. <laughs> and having Dan rather do it is not a good choice. Yeah. You know? Right. We then cut to the siege of Quezon and the Tet Offensive. And <clears throat> Philip Caputo talks about Quezon. Hanks discusses the latter. Tet. I, again, I'm very surprised that, again, this was a very good opportunity to talk about some of the dynamics of the Vietnam War. Because there's always been a debate about whether or not Quezon the siege of the marine base in the north of Vietnam, north, northern part of South Vietnam, was related to Tet because Khe Sanh started a few weeks before the Tet Offensive. It's later turned out that in the state of scholarship today, the consensus is that Khe Sanh was a diversion for Tet, which Westmoreland, the commanding general there, fell for all right. OK. And so as so many of these crack troops, which Moreland was sending up north, the Tet Offensive began with a combination of the Viet Cong and some North Vietnamese regulars, not some, but actually tens of thousands coming across the Cambodian border. All right. Later on, the commander of the North, General, the, the North Vietnamese Army, General Giop later admitted that Quezon itself was not important, but only served as a diversion to draw American forces away from the population centers of the South. And that, of course, is important because that's one of the reasons Tet was so successful. All right. Now, th this part of the program ends with somebody saying that Tet was a military defeat but such a shock that it succeeded psychologically. I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. Militarily, what Tet showed was two very important points. The first is that the three-year escalation by Johnson and Westmoreland had been a failure. No major city in South Vietnam was secure from attack. Not even the American embassy in Saigon. All right. The enemy was everywhere. All right. And armed and ready to kill the, the whole strategy of wearing down the opponent through a war of attrition was misguided and in the end useless. Secondly, and I think this is even more important, it showed that this whole manufactured country of South Vietnam was nothing but a hollow shell without American troops. Tet probably would have collapsed the Saigon government. All right. Johnson and Westmoreland had built no effective independent fighting force there. And it was the exposure of those two failures that ended up cashiering both Johnson and Westmoreland. Death. And also, Johnson finally got the message that we shouldn't be sending any more combat troops there. Because if you can believe it, Westmoreland wanted 200,000 more troops shipped into Vietnam. I think the third result of Chet, and this is completely ignored by this program, was it showed the astonishing lack of American intelligence. All right. I mean, when you can't predict an offense of that big coming right down the middle of the plate, I mean, what good is your intelligence anyway? You know, but that didn't seem to hurt Ted Shackley, who was a CIA station chief in Saigon at that time. All right. All right. All right. The complement to this part of the of what was going on in Vietnam is that the American army was disintegrating. The My Lai massacre took place in March of 1968, and if you can believe it, the show doesn't mention that. Mm. Right. And I also could find. No mention of what Mi Lai was very probably a part of, which is Operation Phoenix, which was a CIA systematic and brutal program to torture and kill civilians who are suspected of being Viet Cong. All right. Reporters like Cy Hirsch had denied Mi Lai was part of the Phoenix program. But later writers like Doug Valentine have discovered new evidence which indicates it was. All those are all ignored. Mm -hmm. And I also believe 
that the show kind of ignores the whole point of why Johnson ref- did not run. If you remember, he came on TV at the end of March 1968 and made this very surprising announcement that he would not run for re-election. All right? There's two reasons today in the literature that indicate why he would not. The first is that he had a conference with what was called the wise men in the White House, and he brought in a briefer to explain how Tet was really a military loss for the communists. At that point, former Secretary of State Dean Atchison got up and walked out. Later on, a Johnson aide called and asked him why. And he said, I'm not going to sit through any more canned Pentagon briefings, all right? I want to see the raw reports, and I want to talk to the people on the ground. After that, LBJ sent Secretary of Defense Clark Clifford over to the Pentagon to do just that. Now, Clifford had been a hawk on the war. After two weeks of asking questions and getting reports from the Pentagon, he completely reversed position, and he realized what an utter and complete sinkhole Vietnam was because these guys couldn't answer his questions. All right? And he would ask questions like, okay, what if we increase our troops by 50,000? You know, can, can they bring more Vietnamese regulars down through the Ho Chi Minh Trail? And he would get an answer like, well, probably. Mm. Yeah, so, <laughs> so after about two weeks of this, you know, Clef- Clifford decided there was no way out. And he told Johnson to seek a negotiated settlement. All right. And so that was the first thing. The second thing was that after Eugene McCarthy did so well in New ha- the New Hampshire primary, which is about the middle part of March. All right. Uh, he only lost by something like seven points to Johnson. Robert Kennedy then announced his nomination to run a few days later. And so at this point, his Johnson's campaign managers in Wisconsin, which was the next big primary, told him that you're going to get blasted. Your, your campaign is completely collapsed in Wisconsin. And in fact, the Wisconsin primary, I think, was April, April the 2nd, and Johnson lost by something like 25 points. Okay, so that is – those are the two reasons, you know, why he decided not to run. And he was just going to go ahead and try for a negotiated settlement instead. And the, this film doesn't mention either one. This is how bad the scholarship is in this. All right. Then we shift ground to Memphis, all right, and we get King's role in the sanitation worker strike there in March and April, which eventually led to his assassination on April the 4th. There's absolutely no discussion of all the strange circumstances surrounding this. And in fact, they actually rely on the late Billy Kyles as a witness who some people actually think, like Judge Joe Brown, might have actually been part of the plot, all right? And there's very little mention, very little, about what King was trying to do in 67 and 68, which was expanding his original focus, you know, into things like the Vietnam War and the economy, all right? All right. Was there any mention of the COINTELPRO being used against him or any of the J. Edgar Hoover stuff like that? No. No. Incredible. Right. Now, Hanks has always had a weakness for going for cultural history. All right. So then we cut to, I guess this is supposed to show his sensitivity to 
African America, African Americans. We go to James Brown and Diana Ross in the music business, and then we go to In the Heat of the Night, winning the Best Picture Oscar, and then he just descends into almost parody with a section on Planet of the Apes, all right, uh, with Charlton Heston, with that famous scene at the end with the Statue of Liberty destroyed, and and this idiot Rick Perlstein, you know this. Uh, historian of the rise of the right in the 60s he says something like well the riots in the cities were reflected in the destruction of the statue yeah please what? my aching back only only platone could put that on the air that sounds horrible I, I i i yeah i know i really wish what they would have focused on more was the kerner commission because the kerner commission was a a, a, a very distinguished body that wrote a 423-page 400 report on the causes of the rioting from 1967 uh, up to 1968. And it became a bestseller. I think it sold 2 million copies. Hmm. And for, for that time, it was really an insightful report. It, it basically said that in more than half the cases – the riots were started by an opening episode of police brutality that other people reacted to. And it was fueled by frustration with both the educational programs available and the failed housing in the areas. And by the way, again, let me add something to this. I know this is a fact to this day. Which shows you, of course, that we've never really overcome these problems because when I was teaching uh, in the L.A. school district in the 90s, all right, I used to teach summer school a lot of the time. And so one summer I taught at um, a, a high school on the west side of Los Angeles, all right, and in my second period economics class, I had about – I'd say one-third of that class was African-American. So one afternoon, I drove over to the post office to mail a letter, and I noticed that the area was all white and Asian, just driving about two miles on the street to, to get to the post office. So the next day, I came back in that class. I said, where do you guys live? And they said, we live in South Central. And I go, well, how do you enroll here if you live over there? And they said, we come before the semester starts, and we take out P.O. boxes at the post office. Hmm. I said, you commit mail fraud. And they said, yeah. <laughs> okay. I said, but then how do you get here from way over there? And they said, the metro. I said, the metro. I go, what time do you have to wake up? And they go, 530. Wow. And I go, how many transfers do you take? Three. Three. And I said, why do you put yourself through all that? They had a very simple answer. We don't want to go to the schools in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. All right. So the Kerner Commission, way back in 1968, you know, was very insightful about this. The problem is, but they even criticized the media, okay, for not focusing on these problems. And the, the very famous quote from that report is, our nation is moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate but unequal. Well, this thing was so incendiary that Johnson ignored it when it came out. He completely ignored it when it came out. You know how you're supposed to meet with the commission and you get a photo op and the guy gives you the book? You know, like they did at the Warren Commission? Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, that didn't happen with the Kerner Commission. See, and, and that... Johnson ignoring that report, again, they miss a very good opportunity here. That was the beginning of the new policy under Richard Nixon and his domestic advisor, Pat Monahan. Hmm. 
which Pat Monahan immortally labeled a period of so-called benign neglect towards the race problem. All right. And that was a very good opportunity to center on that because exactly what Nixon did. All right. Now, the third large event after Vietnam and King is the Democratic race between McCarthy and Robert Kennedy. All right. Tim Naftali says that Kennedy did not enter until Johnson had already been wounded by McCarthy in New Hampshire. Uh, utterly false. Bobby Kennedy was having meetings about whether to run or not in both January and February, two months before the New Hampshire primary. His brother Teddy did not want him to run. Most of his advisors did not want him to run. They said, "You're you're because this was before Johnson dropped out. You're going to split the party." They said. Jackie Kennedy did not want him to run. She had a different reason. She thought he was going to get shot. You know, she ended up being correct. All right. The the person who pushed Bobby Kennedy into running was his wife Ethel. She says, whether you win or lose, you have to stand up for what you believe in. All right. And so he had decided, and by the way, this is in Jules Whitcover's book, 85 Days, which has been out there for, oh my God, 45 years. Okay. It was a chronicle of RFK's last campaign that he had decided to enter the race about four days before the primary. But he did not want to announce because he didn't want to have an impact on the battle between McCarthy and Johnson in New Hampshire. All right? Okay, the film then depicts Robert Kennedy delivering his great speech in Indianapolis on the night of King's murder. All right? Again, this offered so many opportunities to name just one. Bobby Kennedy got the news of King being shot during a rally in Muncie, Indiana. Okay, the Indiana primary was going on. When he got the news, he got into the plane with Frank Mankiewicz, one of his advisors. As Frank Mankiewicz got on the plane with Bobby Kennedy, he said, Bobby took out a picture of him standing next to Martin Luther King, and he showed it to me. All right, and he and Mankiewicz later said, by doing that gesture, I realized that he thought he was going to be the next guy to be shot. All right, now wouldn't that have been a really great piece of information to convey to the public? Because of what these this wave of assassinations that was decapitating the left in this country at that time, yeah. you know, yeah. Well, you you won't see it here, <laughs> okay? All right. They go through the riots at Columbia, okay? And see, the the, the riots at Columbia were kind of interesting because there it was a a split between the SDS faction. And the African-American students, they had different reasons for going on strike, all right? The SDS guys were upset that Columbia was co cooperating with something called the Institute for Defense Analysis on the Vietnam War. The African-American students were upset because the university was purchasing uh, lower-class land nearby to build what they thought was going to be a segregated gym. A gymnasium. Well, that never gets mentioned here. And neither does the fact that towards the end, the mainstream media threw the students under the bus, even though the fact that the New York Police Department essentially invaded the campus. They injured 100, 100 kids and they arrested 600. All right. It now begins to. The film now goes to Nixon and Wallace, all right, and 
of course, Nixon had was running on the Republican ticket. Wallace was running as a third party candidate. And I don't think that they really made clear what Nixon and Wallace were doing. You know, they handed around at it. But what they were doing, of course, was they decided to exploit all this inner city conflagration on the, in the name, quote, of law and order. And they decided to do this for political purposes. <clears throat> the idea was to ignore the underlying causes, all right, which had been made easy by LBJ ignoring the Kerner Commission. And Nixon particularly began to cultivate what was later to be called – actually, it was Kevin Phillips, his advisor, had made it up already. It was called the Southern Strategy. All right, Kevin Phillips, his advisor, was very open about this, and in fact, there's an article in the New York Times in 1970 where he talked about it. All right, He said one of the things that he noticed about Barry Goldwater's loss – to Lyndon Johnson in 1964 was that besides his home state of Arizona, Goldwater only took five other states, but those five states were all in the deep south. And this, this is a very important point. Phillips took – the reason Goldwater took those states – was that he had voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Therefore, he advised his party that we should enforce this Voting Rights Act, the new Voting Rights Act that Johnson passed in 65, because, and I'm quoting here, the, no, the more Negroes who register as Democrats in the South, the sooner the Negrophobe whites will quit the Democrats and become Republicans. That's where the votes are. All right. Without that, the whites will black backslide into their old comfortable arrangement with the local Democratic Party. And that was clearly the Republican strategy. All right. And it's been the Republican strategy almost ever since. See, because the white voters in the South outnumbered the African American voters by at least three to one. All right. So Phillips just did the math. Okay, if if we can show the Democrats as the party of civil rights and voting rights, okay, for that's fine. Let them take the black voters. We want the more populist, the more populist right wing voters in the South with, the, you know, those old Dixie guys, Battle Ham of the Republic and all those guys, you know, who still think they won the war. We want those guys because there's so many more of them. Right. See, if it would have been me producing this thing, I would have had Kevin Phillips on reading his memo. OK. Meanwhile, I would have juxtaposed that. With Bobby Kennedy in November of 1963, as his brother is visiting Dallas, writing out a letter of resignation because he thinks that he's lost the election for John F. Kennedy because he was too far out in front on the civil rights issue. And he had lost his, and because he had been a campaign manager, he realized the, the more he pressed this issue, the more states they were going to lose in the South. All right. See, that, that would have been a really great thing to put on this. You know, this, this tragic moral quandary between – because it's literally you do the right thing. That is, you stand up for the civil rights of black Americans and you lose. I mean, that's one definition of tragedy. Right. Okay, doing the morally correct thing and sacrificing yourself in the process. You know? And the thing is, <laughs> what that would have accented was the fact 
that the 18 previous presidents prior to JFK had ignored the issue. And they had allowed a system of segregation and discrimination to first rise and then flourish in the South. And this includes FDR and Truman. I mean, all FDR did was he decided to integrate the munitions industry. Right. That is the the the, the, the okay. So you, so that's which is not very difficult to do. Okay. All Truman did was integrate military bases. Who the heck goes there? You know. And so that's as far as these Democrats would go. All right. It's as far as they thought they could go without losing everything else. Right. All right. OK. And so Bobby Kennedy, by 1963, understood that the backlash that things like bringing out the military at Ole Miss, like facing off against George Wallace at the University of Alabama – which had all been done in public, national television, etc., that that had created this white backlash that the Republicans were now going to, man to manipulate. Th that would have been a great thing to put on this show, I believe. But forget it. Hankson goes from didn't have any interest in it. Yeah, I mean, it seems so, such a strange thing to try to do is present one year as a history, but only stay within that one year and not be able to provide any backstory. What kind of history can you possibly well, show well, see, about yeah, that? Yeah, you're exactly right, David, because you could have done it in that series called The 60s because Hanks and Ghostman did that. That would have been a great backdrop to do this whole thing, but they didn't do it very well there either. Right. You know? And then, yeah, again, see, Hanks thinks he's a historian, okay, but he really, he doesn't, He's not very good at doing in-depth stuff or complex things. And this is the easiest kind of history that he does. You know, it's pretty much high school stuff. All right. Now, as we go into the last part, the last part, of course, uh, concerns the actual race in 1968 you know, for the presidency. Nixon had a very well-planned, well-organized campaign. He got in early. His two opponents in the beginning part were Michigan Governor George Romney and the governor of New York, Nelson Rockefeller. In 1967, Romney made a mistake, and he told the truth about Vietnam. In explaining his early support for the war, he said he'd been brainwashed by the army about it. And that eventually was true, of course, but the Republican Party didn't want to hear that. All right, And so this forced him to leave the field in February. Rockefeller vacillated, hesitated, and did not enter the race until the end of April. He did fairly well. He came in second at the convention in Miami. Ronald Reagan challenged Nixon in some of the primaries, but only won his home state of California. Sparrow Agnew, the governor of Maryland, was nominated for vice president because he had delivered a scolding to civil rights demonstrators in Maryland. And, you know, like I said, the Republican strategy was to counter this whole uh, uprising with civil rights and manipulate white backlash. And Agnew was a good guy for that. This was a milestone. And again, I don't think that this show makes enough of it. Because when you analyze this, Nixon's victory and the failure of Romney and Rockefeller to challenge him from the center marked the beginning of the end of the moderate and liberal wings of the grand old party. It's hard to believe that there uh, was such a thing back then, but there actually was. The moderate wing – was represented by people like Senator John Sherman Cooper. Okay, the liberal wing was represented by people like Jacob Javits of New York. All right. What happened is once they failed, 
to stop Nixon. It was a challenger from the far right, Ronald Reagan, who then eventually became president. And that began, this was the beginning, Reagan's victory in 80 is the end. You know, that began the right wing radicalization of the Republican Party. You know, led, you know, William F. Buckley got his wish, all right, as going ahead and manipulating people like Reagan, Newt Gingrich, and Tom DeLay. So today, the Republican Party is, I mean, there is no moderate, <laughs> forget liberal, there's no moderate wing of the Republican Party at all in Capitol Hill, yeah. right? Now, we then go to California, and we go to the assassination of Robert Kennedy, and like with the King case, this film does not do anything to alert the reader as to the true circumstances of that assassination. Tim Naftali says words like, Kennedy exited the embassy room, walked through the pantry, and Sirhan was waiting for him. All right. Well, you got to say that to be on CNN, right? Okay, but the real fact is that Sirhan was escorted into the pantry by the infamous girl in the polka dot dress after he shared coffee with her. Or as Sirhan himself said, quote, then she moved and I followed her. She led me into a dark place, unquote. All right, now there's a very interesting moment that comes after this. In the aftermath of the shooting, as Sirhan is being pummeled, one person cries out, stop, we don't want another Oswald. Now, that person, whether he realized it or not, that exclamation bridged a Jungian five-year national psychological chasm that extended from Dallas, Texas, all right, with Ruby rubbing out Oswald on November 24th, to Bobby Kennedy getting killed, all right? And the show doesn't say anything about that at all, all right? Kennedy's death is followed by the subsequent Requiem Mass at St. Patrick's in New York, featuring Ted Kennedy's uh, memorable eulogy. We then see the famous railroad car journey from New York to Washington, where two million spectators lined the tracks to say goodbye and pay their respects to Bobby Kennedy. Hanks comes on, dissipates the whole thing by saying words to the effect, and that was the end of 1968. Oh my God. Tom, that was not just the end of 1968. Okay? That was the end of what most historians would call the second phase of the 60s. You know, most people call 60 to 63 the Camelot 60s of hope for change, of a new direction, etc., the new frontier. That came to an end in 1963 in Dallas. The second phase is the angry 60s. All right? That is civil rights protests, anti-Vietnam War protests, riots in the cities, etc. That was ended with Bobby Kennedy getting killed in Los Angeles. And it was the murders of King and RFK that spelled the end of all the great promise and hope that the early 60s had. After that, you had the escape and the drugs and psychedelic rock epitomized by Woodstock in 1969. In other words, the decade was essentially shot to death. But you're not going to have Tom Hanks say that. All right. During Kennedy's funeral at Arlington, many inhabitants of Resurrection City, the site of the Poor People's Campaign, which was going to be in Washington, journeyed over to pay their last respects. You know, this was fitting in more than one aspect because it was Bobby Kennedy through Marion Wright who had given King the idea for the Poor People's March. The film doesn't take notice of that, that irony. That both men, the guy who originated, the guy who executed the idea, were now dead. 
nor does it note that Tom Hayden was about to lead the demonstrations in Chicago, was weeping in a pew during the Requiem Mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral, the leader of the SDS. Yeah, that's an interesting fact. I didn't hear that before. Yeah. I, I think he subconsciously realized that it was all over now, you know. And that, of course, would have been a great lead-in to the disaster of the Democratic Convention in Chicago, all right, where Hubert Humphrey had entered the race late, bypassing any primaries, all right, but now with Bobby Kennedy dead, all right, he was now able to win his party's nomination, okay, and so McCarthy, as the film notes, he sort of slid off the grid after Bobby Kennedy defeated him in California. All right, he, he really didn't fight or register anything on a national scale. So that there wasn't any alternative to Humphrey. And that was the cause of the demonstrations and the rioting that took place in Chicago. Because all those kids that were there who wanted to stop the war didn't have anybody. Because at this point, Humphrey had not denounced the war. He was still in tow to Johnson at that time. All right. Now, also another point. It, it's not really accurate today to do what the film says and convey the fact that the networks really covered the rioting outside. That's not really true. Because later on, there were a lot of film, private films, that were shown at the riots, but during the actual broadcast of the convention, for instance, NBC had 19 hours of total coverage. Out of those 19 hours, only 14 minutes of that coverage was on the demonstrations and police beatings outside, mm -hmm. which if you can just do the math and you'll figure out that that's like well less than 5%, you know, <laughs> of the coverage, probably more like three. You know, so that's an illusion to say that it was covered on national TV. It, it really was not. It was only just a few moments that the networks broke away from what was inside to what was going on outside. All right. Now, besides the Chicago demonstrations failing due to the brutality of the Chicago police and Mayor Richard Daley, all right, you also had the flame out of the Poor People's March in Washington. Without Bobby Kennedy, you had the first, that is the Chicago riots. Without King, you had the second, the failure of the Poor People's March. All right? And daily, again, this was, this was something I think that, the, that they missed. Daily, with the death of Robert Kennedy, Daly was almost determined to stamp out this left-wing uprising, okay, to the point that the police even raided Gene McCarthy's headquarters at the Hilton Hotel, okay, which is kind of amazing when you think of it, you know, Gene McCarthy is supposed to be a radical, okay, you know, but that's how, that, that's how determined he was. Okay, to do Johnson's bidding and to secure Humphrey the nomination. Well, the point is that because Humphrey was still in Johnson's pocket concerning the war, all right, he did not announce his support for a bombing halt in negotiations until the last month of the campaign. And McCarthy, because of that, would not endorse him until the last week. See, if you do the math... It's very easy to come to the conclusion that Kennedy and McCarthy could have beaten Humphrey at the convention. All right. They could have stopped him from winning a first ballot victory. And then Kennedy would have probably won on the second ballot. And he would have promised McCarthy, you know, either the vice presidency or secretary of state or something in his administration. And that's what would have happened. All right. All right. And so 
what happened, of course, is that because Humphrey was so late to come around in the war, he fell about one percentage point short of beating Nixon. And although the film tries to say that Illinois, which went for Nixon, made the difference, that's not really true if you check the Electoral College. <clears throat> Nixon still would have won. The difference, I believe, is if you analyze the Wallace campaign, and I have a link there to a pretty good analysis of that. See, this was the beginning of peeling away the white middle class from Roosevelt's New Deal coalition. Okay? Wallace, is in, a, in essence, did that. All right. Now, to the film's credit, it does mention the October surprise of 1968. That is Nixon's actions through Republican lobbyist Anna Chenault to sabotage Johnson's attempt to get negotiations going in Paris between Saigon and Hanoi. It turned out to be quite effective, and it probably cost Humphrey the election. All right. Um, President Tu in Saigon gave a 27-minute speech a few days before uh, the election, saying he was not going to abide by Johnson's wishes. And that probably had a lot to do with stopping Humphrey's rush at the end. All right. But the film, I believe, doesn't ask the next logical question. Since Johnson knew about Nixon's subversion while it was in progress, why didn't he make it public? All right. He also had the evidence that the Greek junta in Athens had funneled Nixon a half a million dollars during his campaign, which, which was clearly a bribe. You know? yeah. And Johnson, you've know, you got to ask the question, did Johnson like not want Humphrey to win? You know, I mean, some people, some journalists and some writers have actually written that Johnson actually preferred Nelson Rockefeller hmm. okay, over, over over Hubert Humphrey because he thought Rockefeller would stay more true to him on the war. Hmm. Well, we also we have, still have this strange thing going on where, you know, Barack Obama sees supposedly all these kind of things happening with the hacking and the DNC and he's trying to get Mitch McConnell to sign a bipartisan letter with him instead of just coming out and trying to, you know, alert people what's going on. So, yeah, so these same strange yeah. things. Um, in some, I think you, you can understand this by now. Um, oh, I, let me just have this conclusion. The, the film ends with Apollo 7 and Apollo 8. Hanks has always had this hang-up with the Apollo mission. And the message is supposed to be, I think, that somehow, even though 68 was a terrible year, the fact that it had Apollo 7 and Apollo 8 actually salvaged it, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. But it's the kind of mentality that Tom Hanks and Gary Goldsman have. All right. In sum, this is a very disappointing and mediocre rendering of what was a tumultuous, very important year. All right. What Playtone does here is just simply slap together archival footage with talking heads, which would not be bad if the talking heads had something original or insightful to say. But they don't, okay? It's not even close. I mean, when I can rewrite the script in my analysis, then you know what's left out, all right? And that's a real shame because what happened in 1968 casts a very long shadow, and it's a shadow that cuts well in to the new millennium. As I've tried to say here, okay, like for example, the radicalization of the right wing and the Republican Party. Right. Um. Well, I mean, what is even the purpose of this? Didn't we just? How did this compare to how, say, Ken Burns just treated 1968? You know, what was that? A few months ago, even like, was it any different from that? Any difference between uh, when Ken Burns did his whole Vietnam War special? You know, was it? Oh, oh, okay. That's an interesting question because I reviewed that, of course, also. And I was really disappointed in that one, too, in that uh, multi-part documentary. All right. And I think, really, 
if you want to really be honest about this, I think that Ken Burns' production is much closer to something Platone could live with than it would be with a really honest documentary like the very famous excellent documentary by Peter Davis, Hearts and Minds. Oh, that is a great movie. Okay. That, that is really a great yeah. or documentary. See, that, to me, that was a much more honest look at the Vietnam War. So if you had to put it on a spectrum, I would say that Ken Burns' Vietnam thing is closer to Tom Hanks and Gary Ghostman than it is to Peter Davis. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really, you know, I'm really glad you brought this up because... I think this tells us something about our culture, you know, and what, what's happening to it, you know, that it's becoming kind of homogenized, pasteurized, whatever you want to use, whatever word you want to use about it, washed out, diluted. You know, this great hope we had for an alternative media, you know, that cable TV was going to represent, you know, it hasn't really come close to fruition you know and, and it's essentially if you ask me it's more of what as they used to call it before it's more the of the of the big three if you remember the networks used to be dominated by cbs abc and nbc you know and people thought well once we break up that monopoly people are going to have a real choice sure. well I don't think it turned out that way, you know, and I think this is an example, and even the Ken Burns show is an example, because what's happened to PBS, very simply, is that as the Republicans have taken more and more money away from uh, public broadcasting, they've had to go more and more to right-wing foundations to get anything at all, and so that's what they've done. You know, and so Ken Burns, of course, if you take a look at his documentary, he took money from the, from the Cook Brothers Foundation. And so you, you don't get money like that for telling the absolute truth about something as bad as Vietnam. Right. Um, I have one, one question prepared here, and then I've got one more that I just want to ask at the end. But uh, you've just documented, like, Tom Hanks' version of history and sort of a more, more realistic version of history. So, you know, what do you think happens when we keep, the country keeps telling itself this kind of sanitized version of history? And then do you think there's any, anything about this mismatch of like what a country keeps telling itself in its mainstream media and then the actual reality that we kind of see people today when we end up with, say, Donald Trump, you see all these people saying, well, you know, this isn't America, or this isn't America, we know. Uh, is there some connection here? Is you know, kind of is the America we know when you really look at it. What's going on here? Is this, is this part of the problem, some of this kind of phony history that we've got? Yeah, I, 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 I think that that's correct. I think if you have so many people who are watching this stuff, and there's no doubt that, you know, that you've got literally millions of people, you know, watching this, what I believe is a very misleading portrait of the past, you know, and what it does is it funnels what is supposed to be the truth into something that's really more politically palatable, all right? And if you don't stand up for that truth, if you don't stand up for that truth, you know, then you leave the door open to somebody like Trump. Okay? You know, and really Ronald Reagan was one of the first politicians who tried to politically capitalize the Vietnam War and disguise it for what it really was. If you remember, what he called it was the so-called noble cause, mm. you know, which sort of reminds me of how the Southerners thought about the Civil War as the noble cause. There was nothing noble about the Confederacy. 
you know, and I, I blame Ken Burns for giving Shelby foot all of that, all those talking minutes on his documentary, The Civil War. If you remember, Shelby Foote was by far and away the historian had the most face time on that. And Ken Burns made a millionaire out of Shelby Foote, okay, um, by selling so many books for him. Shelby Foote, I don't think there's any other way to say this, was more or less an apologist for the Confederacy. <clears throat> Uh, he tried to make that into, a, as they say, a noble cause, just like Reagan tried to make Vietnam into a noble cause. You know, and I, and I think, I think that that's really kind of dangerous to do, and I think it misleads people. You know, and like I said, when you pile one illusion that America defeated the Germ the Germans in World War II. And you pile that into the Vietnam War, which I think Ken Burns did, all right, then I, I, I really think what you're doing is you're dumbing down America. Mm. And that's what these documentaries do. You know, and, and, and the, between the ones I've talked to you about, which are – tonight I talked to you about Ken Burns and Tom Hanks in 1968. Last week I, we did – uh, the Kennedys, an American dynasty. The, I don't think there's any really, there's no def scholarly defense for doing this kind of thing. Not in this day and age. And like I said, it's a great disappointment of what has happened to the so-called revolution in television, which wasn't a revolution at all. Okay, it was just essentially more of the same. You know, and, and, you're, and, and you're right. I think they complement each other, you know. Well, just one more question. Uh, this is only related to the fact that Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. Uh, there was for a while, I know John Judge used to talk about it, there was a, a sort of movement to get the Martin Luther King files released in the same way that the JFK files were. Is there anything ever talked about that anymore, and do you think that's that's something possible, and do you think someone will ever make a, a Martin Luther King movie in the same way that Oliver Stone made JFK? You know something? That, that is such a wonderful idea, and it's true that um, John Judge actually tried to get legislation passed, okay, to enact a Martin Luther King declassification. But the problem was when Cynthia McKinney lost her uh, seat in the House, mm -hmm. okay, that was the kind of end of John Judge's career, you know, in the House. Oh. And, you know, you know, nobody else except John and Cynthia McKinney were going to sponsor that kind of legislation, you know, and so as far as I know, it's been kind of done and gone since that time. Well, that's a shame. That would be some very interesting history to, to crack open. That would be the real domestic side of uh, as, as astonishing as the JFK files are. That would be equally astonishing to see all that stuff. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to add before we go? No, no, I think we covered it pretty well. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for talking to us, and uh, look forward to talking to you again. Okay, thanks, David. This is Our Hidden History.